The following presentation is brought to you by the Realm Network. This is the Brad and Britt Podcast on the Realm Network. And now, from the TarHillDentist.com studios, Brad and Britt. Welcome to the Brad and Britt Podcast. It's great to have you along with us here. We've got Deborah Ross, the Democratic candidate for U.S. Senate, the Richard Burr seat, of course, up for grabs in the 2016 election. This is Deborah Ross, who uh, spent many, many great years in the North Carolina House and head of the ACLU. It's great to have you along. Great to be with you guys. I was driving over and I thought, here we are in North Carolina. It's 2016. Trump has run through the entire field by coming up with obnoxious nicknames and knocking out everybody. Richard Burr, in effect, has embraced Donald Trump. And I was thinking it's possible they might run a campaign against you in the the way that Donald Trump would do it. And I thought, all right, so what is the most simplistic, irritating, obnoxious, disgusting thing you can say about Deborah Ross in an insult. And I'm all right, Deborah Ross, the ACLU hippie chick, vote for Burr. What what do you do about mm-hmm. it? Well, what I say is that Richard Burr doesn't want to run on his record because it's so out of touch with people in North Carolina that he has to make a new friend in Donald Trump and run around with him in North Carolina. I mean, the fact of the matter is that Richard Burr has been up in Washington, you know, cutting Social Security and Medicare and not sticking up for women when they want equal pay for equal work. So he would have to come up with these little adolescent stunts to distract people from how he hasn't been serving them. Well, I, I think that's effective, but you also know that there are just a number of people who live around the state, and they, when they hear the, the four letters ACLU put together in that order, they have a very guttural, visceral, and about five other adjective reaction to that. <laughs> how, how are you going to convince those people that you somehow understand the struggles that they go through in their lives? Well, because I do understand them, and we're campaigning on economic security for every generation, And uh, my record at the General Assembly has been to stick up for everyday people. And Richard Burr's record in Congress has been to cut their Social Security and Medicare and not care about raising the minimum wage. So I've been fighting for folks all the way along. And um, a lot of people want somebody who's willing to stand up to government when it does the wrong thing. And that's been my history. I worked on comprehensive ethics reform when we didn't have enough uh, checks and checks on our politicians and politicians were getting rich off of their uh, political office. I've never been afraid to stand up for what's right. And um, I'm going to do the same thing on the campaign trail. And I'm going to do the same thing as a U.S. senator. Hmm. Well, this is an interesting moment in time here in May because when you're running for the U.S. Senate, it really isn't about state issues per se, but because HB2 has been completely nationalized by Pat McCrory, he seems to think that this is his way either out of this or onto uh, Donald Trump's ticket as his vice president. Uh, uh, You're going to find yourself talking about this, and it's probably going to stick around for, for for months here, because you know we had another cancellation in uh, North mm-hmm. Carolina. You know, we had Maroon Five drop out, and of course their response is, uh, "Well, but they'll play in uh, Russia. How come they'll play in Russia, but they won't play in North Carolina?" So you're going to have to handle that. But Richard Burr has gone essentially silent on this, has he not? Well, Richard Burr has said three things about HB two. First, he said it doesn't discriminate. Wrong. Then he said it's not a federal issue. Wrong. And then he said he didn't think it would affect the state's economy. Wrong. The fact of the matter is that HB2 has ruined the good name of North Carolina, and it's having significant effect on our economy. I mean, the high-point furniture market can't attract people to come there 
And that's something that we do every year. It's it's sad that concerts are getting canceled, but the High Point Furniture Market is the bread and butter for people in the triad area every single year. Wilmington is losing film business. There was a front page article um, in the Raleigh paper this week talking about how people want to go to South Carolina rather than North Carolina on vacation because South Carolina is more progressive. This isn't, it's about losing that money, but it's also about people not having their livelihood. I mean, imagine being a seasonal worker working on the the North Carolina coast where you know you have to make your whole year's income in a short period of time. And there's, there are cancellations. People who rent out boats won't be able to do that. This bill has, is a black mark on North Carolina's reputation. Do you talk to some of your former colleagues in the General Assembly, and what are they telling you about uh, the bill and about the law? Well, um, one of my colleagues, former colleague Aaron Jackson, is the leader of the repeal HB2 movement. And um, he's a lawyer. And he was on the floor when that bill came out. You know, it got passed in like 12 hours with hardly any opportunity to review it. But Darren is a bright lawyer, and he asked on the floor, what is this in here about um, taking all rights to sue in federal court, in state court away, and making everybody go to federal court for employment discrimination? And they claimed, oh, no, no, it won't be so bad. Well, is that that? North Carolina is the only state other than Mississippi that makes you go to federal court for religious discrimination or age discrimination. HB2 made it so that no municipality in North Carolina could have more have a minimum wage that's higher than seven dollars and twenty five cents an hour. Uh, uh, HB2 is hurting working people every day. Right. Deborah Ross, do you think that they thought this out a couple of months ago ahead of time? And I know that the, the, the stock line is, well, Charlotte did this, so we had to respond to it. That's what they're saying. But do you think that they were able to put A, B, C, D, and E down on paper and say, well, we know this is going to happen, but we're willing to risk this in order to take everybody's mind off of, say, Donald Trump at the top of the ticket? Because it's a classic North Carolina social wedge issue, and this is probably all we're going to have because Trump could kill us. Mm-hmm. I think I don't know whether they were thinking about Donald Trump, but I think they were thinking about turning this in to one of these smoke and mirror wedge issues. And then when they figured out they were going to do it, there was a wish list of all the ways to take away people's working people's rights to get higher salaries or be able to stick up for themselves um, in the workplace. And it just when I was in the legislature, we used to call these things a Christmas tree bill. And it was just a Christmas tree bill for the radical right. We have uh, we asked our listeners to uh, send in some questions. We got several thoughtful questions. Ryan in Winston Salem writes, "Miss Ross, you've donated to Hillary Clinton already. Do you think that will hurt you or help you with the Democratic base? Also, why do you support Hillary Clinton over Senator Sanders?" Well, what I would say is that um, Hillary Clinton is our presumptive nominee. Senator Sanders has fantastic ideas for a lot of things. And so there are some things where I see Senator Sanders um, really pushing things in exactly the right way. I have a lot of Sanders supporters on my, for my campaign, and I a, a really think that he has done some wonderful things. But Hillary Clinton um, is ready to take on this challenge, and um, I think that she'll do a good job. Do you think Senator Sanders has the right approach in saying that he's going to follow this right down to the last dog dies and go all the way to the convention and fight at the convention? Do you think that's good for the party? Do you think that is helpful for the chances of beating Donald Trump in November? Well, the thing about the Democratic Party is that we um, we care about having an open situation. I've, I've run in primaries. I had a very competitive um, primary with a lot of discussion as it went. And um, I just think it's good to get more people involved. And so what I hope is that however long it takes that we all come together in the end because we know that um, the alternative is not good. And we've got a lot of wonderful people in the party, a lot of wonderful energy. Like I said, I've worked with the Clinton people. I've worked with the Sanders people. And um, 
if we all come together, we're going to win this thing. Right. I, I can't get inside of your, your actual campaign, but I'm trying to think about the war room aspect of this for a moment. Richard Burr was last elected in 2010. That was the year yep. of, the, of the big Obama backlash. Mm-hmm. That, and it was an off-year election, really. There was no presidential thing working. So, tea, it was the Tea Party election. Right, it was the Tea Party election. So now it's 2016, and he doesn't have the benefit of the smaller turnout. He's going to have to be on the ballot against, well, it's going to be two women in North Carolina, Hillary Clinton and you. Uh, are you going to play the evil woman card? <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to play the you deserve better representation in Washington, D.C. card. Um, I think that the, this is a, a good time for people to know how they've been represented over the last six years, and not just the last six years, but Richard Burr's whole career. And um, people all over this state have been excited about this campaign. People are signing up. We've gotten people from every county uh, contributing. We're having a great time crisscrossing the state. But everywhere we go, people are telling us that they're sick of the dysfunction in Washington, and they want somebody who's going to stand up for their values, and protect their economic security. And I am that woman. Uh, I'm going to play Megan Kelly for just a moment. This is the question that could ruin your campaign. Lexington or Eastern-style barbecue, which do you prefer? I'm an all-of-the-above kind of girl. Oh, boo! You can't do that! Boo! You can't do that. <laughs> but I will tell you I like fried chicken and pie. And I have, on the campaign trail, had fried chicken and pie for three meals in a row. Don't tell my doctor. I, I would just suggest to you, from a political point of view, you probably need the center of the state more than you need eastern North Carolina because there's more population. <laughs> just go with Lexington. Eastern North Carolina always feels neglected, especially by Richard Burr when he won't even give them their judge that they've been due for 10 years. Nice, nice pivot. Mm. Well, just, just pick one of those and just say, I like the other, but I prefer X. And then I think everyone would respect that. I don't know. I like Brunswick's too, too. I I think we we need to move on. There you go. Here's another question that uh, Caroline sent to us. How can we make college more affordable for the underprivileged? You know, Senator Sanders, of course, has been talking about free college, which seems like a pipe dream for a lot of people, and it doesn't really seem doable or or, or logical. What what can we do? It seems Uh like a, a college education is really the only ticket out for a lot of people who are in the middle class and folks who are uh, poor, how how can we make it more affordable? So I love this question because it's something that I worked on quite a lot when I was in the General Assembly. I represented five colleges and universities in my district, and um, Wake Tech was just on the edge of my district. So there are several things that we can do. First of all, we can make community college free or as close to free as we can. And our community colleges um, right now in North Carolina, if you do well in two years of community college, you can transfer all of those credits to a four-year institution. And that means that, as we all know, community college is more affordable. So that's one thing. We also have this great program in um, North Carolina called Learn and Earn, where if you did a certain amount of work and you um, could show that you needed um, some help with college, that you, college would be more affordable, but you also would be doing some work. Um, we need to keep the cost of public education down. During the recession, what happened was the universities did not get funded the way they, they should have been funded and the way they had been in the past. North Carolina is the oldest public university system in the country. And we need to protect that crown jewel and make sure that it's affordable for more of our students. So those are some things that we can do with the cost of college, both community college and public college. But the other thing that we need to do, and these are things that Richard Burr has not shown leadership on, we need to make sure that we have more Pell Grants. So those grants go to the more lower income students. Richard Burr voted against expanding that program. That, that affected more than half a million North Carolinians. We need to reduce the interest rate for student loans. Congress has taken some small steps toward that, but we need to cap it and not always have it be fluctuating up and down. 
And then we need to allow people to refinance their student loan debt within the income stream that they have. If we do all of those things, we will make a huge, huge dent in the cost of higher education and encourage more people to be able to get the skills that they need. Hmm. Uh, The Supreme Court is in the middle of a four to four tie right now, and the president's nominee isn't going to be getting a hearing, it looks like, for right now. People do not realize. Until after Hillary wins. Right. Then, but, then, but, then but, they'll take them up, right? right but do, do, people, do people realize what a big deal this is? Do they understand that? I think what people, what resonates with people is that the Senate is not doing its job. So most people probably don't know everything that the Supreme Court does every day. But what they do know is that the president has a right to appoint. He has a duty to nominate. And then the Senate has a duty to give advice and consent. And what they know is that this U.S. Senate is working fewer days than any U.S. Senate in the last 50 years. And then they won't even do their job when the president has nominated somebody. Now, they can have a hearing and vote the person down if they don't think he's qualified. But the U.S. Senate refuses to even do its basic job. And people don't like that. Most people, they got to get up and go to work every day. They don't get 19 weeks off every year. And then they don't get to pick and choose what they do when they go every day. And that's what's making people upset with the U.S. Senate. Deborah, where do you think the minimum wage should be set, and, and how, what are you going to say to people? Because you're going to run into a lot of people in North Carolina who feel that raising the minimum wage uh, is ultimately bad for the economy. How do, how do you counter those arguments? So, well, the problem is that the minimum wage hasn't gone up um, in the last several years. And so, it ha- and it's not indexed for inflation, it's not indexed to to go up incrementally. And that's the big problem because it has to take literally an act of Congress to raise the minimum wage. When I was in the General Assembly, I had two opportunities to vote to raise the minimum wage. One, to make the North Carolina minimum wage match the federal minimum wage, and we did that. The other was to raise the minimum wage for state employees. We did that too. And so we, we have got to increase the minimum wage not just for people who work one job, but there are people who are working two or three jobs at minimum wage just to feed their family. And the same kids that we're talking about with these high student loan debts and and college costs, they need to be able to get even close to paying for a chunk of their college. When I was going through college, you could work in the summer and pay for a lot of your college education. So for all these reasons, we need to raise the minimum wage. We need to do it in steps. We can't just, you know, double it overnight. And we need to recognize that in North Carolina, we have our urban areas and we have our rural areas, and the cost of living is different. There are a lot of good proposals for doing it gradually, but also making sure that we don't have to keep having an act of Congress to do it all the time, that people can anticipate and plan for increases to the minimum wage. And I look forward to working on that as a U.S. Senate. All right. Last major topic we want to cover here with you is health care, okay. health care and the Affordable Care Act and the pledge by the Donald Trumps of the world to not on day one, but on minute one after he's inaugurated to repeal it and replace it with a patient centered wonderful, perfect system, and this is. Is in, this is in the balance, and this is a state that never participated with the Medicaid expansion. Again, right. do, do people realize how many hundreds of thousands of folks are being affected by this every day? Well, I can tell you that in the rural areas, um, the fact that we haven't had Medicaid expansion is hurting people's health. It's hurting our rural hospitals because they're having to deal with uncompensated care. We even had a mayor who walked to Raleigh over his uh, rural hospital. But it also is affecting jobs. You know, if we make sure that people have the health care that they need, obviously we're going to have health care providers who 
provide the, provide the services. And so we absolutely have to expand Medicaid, not just for health, but for our hospitals and for, as a jobs issue. I, the I want, Affordable Care Act is not perfect, but I am what, what would certain you do, what would you do to that fix? it is helping, it's helping a lot of people today. And I hope that what we can do is we can make it significantly better. Now, this perfect thing that you're alluding to, it better take care of people who have pre-existing conditions. It better make sure that women don't get charged a higher health insurance premium than men. It better let kids up to the age of 26 stay on their parents' health plan. Because if it doesn't do all of that, it's not doing what the Affordable Care Act has already provided to millions of Americans. What, other than those things that you talked about, making sure that those things stay in, what what would you do to fix it? Well, there are several things that um, that are on the table. One thing that I actually experienced personally is um, we. I don't think we should punish employers who provide more than basic health care to their employees. This is called the Cadillac tax. Right. Um, my my jo- last job before I. Uh, decided to run for U.S. Senate, was working for Go Triangle, which is a transit agency. Well, we had some Cadillac policies there, Cadillac in that you could get two eye exams in a year. Well, if if half of your employees are bus drivers, that's a public safety issue, making sure that people can have excellent vision care. And so we shouldn't be penalizing employers who are making sure that their employees have outstanding health benefits. We should be encouraging employers to do that. So that's one of the issues. Medical device tax is another issue. So it isn't perfect, um, and there are some good suggestions for improving it, and I'm ready to roll up my sleeves and minute one get to work on them. Let's imagine in November you end up winning. You beat Senator Burr. You are the, the next senator from the state of North Carolina. Governor McCrory is sent home. He's sent on his way. Roy Cooper is our new governor. But it seems highly uh-huh. likely that because of gerrymandering and other issues that the General Assembly will still be controlled by the Republicans. How are you going to work with Senator Berger and Speaker Moore to get something done for the people of North and, Carolina? And can you actually do something yeah, is, as, as a U.S. Is there, senator? Is there a way to do that? Yeah, yeah well, well, first of all, um, obviously uh, Roy Cooper would be the governor, and so he works with the legislature. But I can tell you that I have worked with um, Speaker Moore and Senator Berger um, while I was in the General Assembly. One of the nice things about running right now is that because I was in the General Assembly, I have relationships both with Democrats and Republicans that I can call on. And we won't agree on everything, clearly. We don't agree on House Bill 2. But we have worked together in the past. Um, In particular, I've worked with Speaker Moore. We were elected in the same year, and um, we chaired a committee together even. Um, And so I'm a person who can work across the aisle and enjoys working across the aisle. Most of the bills that I sponsored as a legislator got bipartisan support. And so um, everything is about relationships in politics. And I have um, no doubt that uh, I will work with them in the ways that I've worked with them in the past. All right, uh, Deborah Ross, she is the Democratic candidate for U.S. Senate, and uh, we look forward to talking to you again uh, a few weeks, maybe a few months from now, as this campaign really starts to heat up, because, you know, here in, here in podcast world, we, we speak yes. to people who really want to listen to this kind of stuff. They're wonky, and, and they get everything you're talking about, right. but again, at, at, at this point in May, it really hasn't penetrated through. I mean, you know, conventional wisdom is nothing starts until Labor Day. So you're probably just laying the groundwork here, like building a highway. You're just putting the gravel down yep. right now. Mm-hmm. Yep, I, I completely agree. And um, we're laying a lot of good groundwork, but I'm more than happy to be with you again. I've really enjoyed the conversation. So thank you. Brad and Brit.com.